In this presentation, I want to go into power and I want to focus on cycling and power that's used for uh, cycling. And it's used by athletes quite a bit. And it's a very popular tool to have nowadays. Um, and a lot of uh, people use power for different reasons, and I'll go through that. So power, though, uh, let's just work with our, our equation. Remember, energy is the capacity to do work, and those are units of joules. Work is a force applied over some distance when we're dealing with mechan the definition of mechanic from a mechanical world. And so we calculate work based upon the force being applied and the distance that force is being applied over. The units for work are also joule, joules. And that leads back to a work energy theorem, and I have a different lecture on that. Power is how fast work is done, how fast we're applying a force over some distance. So power, equation-wise, is work over delta T, how fast work is being done. Or we can break that down into force times distance divided by delta T, and hopefully you see the D over delta T as uh, velocity. So another way to calculate power is to use the equation force times velocity. Still units of watts for that, uh, regardless if we're using work over delta T or force times velocity. Or if we move into the angular world, we would calculate power by uh, taking the, the product of torque and how fast that torque is being applied. All of these uh, power equations all have the same set of units of watts. Okay, and I've got different lectures on different parts of those equations. So I wanna go more into how to measure it in the real world and how to use that information. But even before I jump into that, and I know um, if you listen to my other lecture, lectures on work energy uh, power or other power lectures, you'll see I, I go over this a lot because I think this is really important to understand. Where do you find power? Well, you find power all over the place. Uh, if you go in your kitchen and you look at a blender, you look at the blender and look at the little tag on the blender, it will have some wattage. I uh, love using my blender for smoothies and I need a real powerful blender. What is a powerful blender? It's one that has a, a high watt rating for the blender. That means it's transforming electrical energy to spinning the blender really at a fast rate if it's got a high power. So the, all that's telling me that power, if I look at a blender and it says 200 watt blender, that's telling me how fast electrical energy is being transformed to mechanical energy of spinning that blade. <clears throat> and if I have a more powerful blender, maybe a 500 watt blender, well, then that's going to blend faster. <laughs> it's going to, it, it, it won't get uh, hung up on blending ice cubes or what have you. Where else do you find blower? I'm doing this out of order. Um, light bulbs. You pick up a light bulb that has a wattage stamp on it. What is that wattage stamp? That's telling you how fast that light bulb will transform electrical energy to light energy. A 60 watt light bulb is brighter than a 30 watt light bulb. Why? Because the light bulb is rated at 60 watts, meaning it's transforming energy at a faster rate from electrical to light energy <clears throat> than the 30 watt light bulb. Speakers, you know, look at your speakers and look at the rate wattage uh, rating on the speakers. What is that they're telling you? That's telling you how fast that speaker is transforming the electrical energy to sound energy. And that's what we hear. More powerful speakers, bigger sound. Heaters. Well, I even have my little space heater right here. I had this out. And this heater is rated at, where's my stamp here? It's rated at 750 watts for the first setting and 1500 watts for the second setting. What is that telling me? That's telling me how fast electrical energy is being transformed to heat energy of two settings, one at a low setting, one at a high setting. The higher setting is transforming electrical energy to heat faster <clears throat> than the 750 watt, the first setting. 
So power is mm, ubiquitous. It's all it's all over the place. And uh, but every time you see watts, anything that, uh, with watts, just realize that is telling you how fast energy is being transformed from one type of energy to another type of energy. I've used electrical here because those are easy examples to see, but there's other ways to transform energy. You can transform potential mechanical energy to kinetic uh, mechanical energy, things like that. <clears throat> okay, I wanna focus in on power and cycling. And if we look at power and cycling, what, and I'll go, to go through some, some bullet points and I'll go through some more details. Power in essence, when I look at a power uh, display while I'm biking and I can see I'm, I'm pedaling at 200 watts, what that represents is how hard the cyclist, in this case it's me, is pushing on the pedals and how fast that pedal's moving. In essence, that's what power is going to represent from a mechanical perspective. Or if we looked at torque, it could be how much torque is being generated to uh, to uh, rotate the pedals and then how fast the pedals are rotating. Either of those equations are fine and you end up getting the same exact answer when you just follow all the math and physics rules of, of using these different parameters. <clears throat> what, what really that power is representing is the transfer of energy from me, the biker, to the bike. And it ends up being analogous to effort or intensity of cycling. If I'm pedaling and I see my display at 200 watts, that's uh, a higher intensity than 150 watts when the computer says 150 watts. Uh, 250 watts would be a higher intensity. 1,000 watts would be a really high intensity. This is similar to heart rate, <clears throat> uh, but heart rate um, it is uh, the way the heart rate monitors work. It's you're, You actually have a lag between what the heart rate monitor is telling you. Usually it's an average over at least six seconds. Sometimes the heart rate monitors are even uh, average over a bigger period of time. But what's interesting is both heart rate and power are in essence proxies for VO2. They're estimates of VO2. They're using, being used as a substitute for VO2 when we're dealing with endurance exercise. For sprinting, for uh, power lifting events, something's a little different. It's not necessarily a VO2 issue at that point. There's some anaerobic contribution that's important that we need to understand. But but uh, for this class, I'm really going to zero in on the endurance performance. All right, so now <clears throat> I think of the equations, I think of algorithms. This is just a little cartoon to uh, illustrate what I'm talking about. We have chemical energy here in the red box. We transform, oh, no, chemical energy is inside our body. Glucose, carbohydrates, and in general, fats. The, those hold potential energy in a chemical state. That's the bonds. <clears throat> protein still a little bit. We do, we don't use proteins that much when we're exercising, but there are times that that we do. But mostly carbohydrates and fats. We take the energy. Our body takes the potential energy in that um, that fuel, carbohydrates or fats, and transforms it ultimately to mechanical energy. In an exercise physiology class or in anatomy and physiology class, you would learn that um, carbohydrates are broken down to yield ATP, adenosine triphosphate, in fats as well. You get that ATP. That ATP is then, adenosine triphosphate, is then used in the sliding filament theory to allow for muscle contraction. Once you have muscle contraction, you have a force being generated and ultimately, we're going to end up with mechanical energy. We're going to have some type of movement that's going to occur from that. So the way I like to think of power, it's how fast we're transforming chemical energy to mechanical energy. This all falls within the study of thermal regulation, believe it or not, because this process of transforming chemical energy to mechanical energy is never 100% efficient. Typically, if we're looking at chemical energy in our body, potential energy in our body, and we take that and transform it to mechanical energy, which is ultimately the movement, we may only end up with 
25% of energy transformed from the chemical state to the mechanical state. Where's the other 75% of that energy go? It goes off as heat. And that's why you study this process called thermal regulation, which ends up being uh, transforming energy from one state to another. Never perfect. Some other uh, form of energy is, is produced and typically it's heat in, in the human body. That's what it is, um, that heat. Uh, and that's why we get warm when we exercise. And we sometimes we want to retain that warmth if we're exercising in a cold environment or we want to get rid of that warmth uh, if we're exercising in a hot environment. So how do we transform chemical energy to mechanical energy? Well, you learned these terms, aerobic power and anaerobic power, most likely in an exercise physiology class or again, anatomy and physiology class even. And you learned about the aerobic uh, metabolic pathway, uh, glycolysis leading to the Krebs cycle, electron uh, transport chain, things like that. All the yield ATP and then ultimately mechanical energy. Well, what's aerobic power tell us? <clears throat> it tells us that, our, that we're transforming chemical ener energy using oxygen to, uh, to, to end up with mechanical energy. We're transforming the chemical energy using oxygen to mechanical energy. Now, you also learn the anaerobic uh, pathways to take glucose, carbohydrate, and yield ATP, which ultimately, again, will be used for mechanical energy. That's anaerobic power. It's using it's uh, transforming chemical energy to mechanical energy without the need for oxygen. And you learn that this pathway, anaerobic pathway, is much faster than the aerobic pathway. That's power how fast we're transforming chemical energy to mechanical energy. And we can generate a lot of power in a very short period of time using the anaerobic pathway, but it's also limited. And you learn this as well. ATP CP can, system can last maybe three seconds. Glycolysis, maybe two minutes. And then we start to fatigue and ultimately are exhausted. Aerobic power, that's a slower rate of transforming chemical energy to mechanical energy, but it can last a longer period of time. All right, and so now how do we determine aerobic power and anaerobic power? Again, these are things you would have learned in another class. You learned about maximum effort graded exercise test. And what you're doing in that test is you're trying to understand what the maximum rate of transforming chemical energy to mechanical energy using the aerobic pathway. That's what you're trying to do. And you call that VO2 max. Well, that VO2 max simply tells you the fastest that that person can, can transform chemical energy to mechanical energy. If you're interested in the anaerobic system, you would do something, sticking with cycling here, you would do something like a 30 second Wingate test, which is an all out effort test from the start, just go all out. <clears throat> and that's what this graph illustrates. This is power on the Y axis. Third time on the x-axis, 30 seconds. And you push, push, push. You go as hard as you can. You had a peak power early on. And then that peak power, or excuse me, that power starts to reduce as you get to the uh, 30 seconds. Whereas during uh, a graded exercise test, this um, red line is the wattage, or excuse me, the, a light blue line is actually the wattage that you're generating during this test. Or this is cycling. And you're going up, 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 up. And the red line is VO2, rate of oxygen consumption goes up with power. Because power represents how fast we're transforming chemical energy to mechanical energy. Aerobic power is simply telling us how fast the aerobic uh, pathway is operating to transform the chemical energy to mechanical energy. And maximum VO2 is just that maximum rate that we have to transform chemical energy to mechanical energy aerobically. The anaerobic pathway has a much higher and much much higher power and much faster rate to transform chemical energy to mechanical energy. This all comes into play with cycling. So let's keep going. All right, so now how do I measure power during cycling? Well, there's all different tools that you can use. And some are better than others and there's advantages or disadvantages to each one. And, and uh, you often have to uh, make some decisions as a, as a user, which one you're gonna go with. 
but you could put a power meter in the rear hub of your uh, wheel. You could put a power meter in the bottom bracket, which is this part here of the, um, the crank system. You could put a uh, power meter in the crank itself, like this one right over, over here, or you could put a power meter on your pedals. All different ways to do it. There's advantages, the disadvantages to each one. I've used uh, just about every one of these at some point. And, um, but at the end of the day, I'm measuring power. I'm measuring mechanical power, but that mechanical power is telling me about physiology, okay? Let's keep going. So how do you view your uh, power data? When you measure it, uh, it was all, it's often displayed, people put a computer on their bike or some type of uh, device that looks a lot like your phone. Uh, so you have different types of devices, some have maps, some have other features in terms of what it displays. You can even put uh, have the power signal go to your watch. And you can even look at your watch uh, while you're, while, not while you're biking, but you can glance at it at least. So all different shapes, all different sizes, and all different features of these different types of uh, power meters. That was uh, one of my pets just knocked her metal dish off the counter. She's eating and uh, pets. <clears throat> all right. Um, so viewing power, all different options. Uh, power software, there's a wide variety of ways to analyze your power data after your ride. And some of these uh, programs will allow you to even predict uh, performance on race day. And so there's some sophisticated algorithms out there. These are just some examples of software, Strava, Training Peaks, Garmin Connect, Golden Cheetah. These are all very popular uh, software, but this is not an exhaustive list. Yeah, in 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 uh, at all. Uh, when you have a power file and you're analyzing afterward, this is typically what it may look like, depending on which software you look, you use you, you are using. You have all your different rides that you accumulate in a in a training log or digital training log, and you uh, often will have a map that that comes from the power meter or probably more likely the the computer, which has a a GPS device in it. So you're able to track where you go and other metrics as well, like heart rate, which is in red, or purple would be the power. And that's what it looks like. It just looks like a lot of squiggly lines, but a lot of squiggly lines means a lot of data. And you can start analyzing those data to try to come up with different understandings of a ride. So for example, I'm not going to go into detail on this one, but this is just a figure from uh, uh, Golden Cheetah. And here's power distribution, and here's um, easy on this side, and this would be really hard over on this side. All right, here's also heart rate data that goes along with this. So uh, easy heart rate, lots of heart rate uh, over here, very little heart rate over here. And this is time spent at, at different intensities. <clears throat> and so here, this was a typical training ride. And for a typical training ride, most of the power is on the low side. So very easy type of ride, maybe a little bit of somewhat hard uh, type of, of, uh, of intensity. And the heart rate data correspond with that. Why? Because heart rate and, and power data are going to be very closely tied because both of these are trying to predict VO2. If you take my 457, 657 class, I spend more time talking about heart rate VO2 relationship. In this class, we uh, spend more time talking about power VO2 relationship. All right, so this is a very typical ride. Typ you know, going for a long ride, I spend more time in easy, uh, so moderate uh, type of intensity. Whether I'm looking at heart rate data or power data, I'll get that same picture. Here's a different file. Now this uh, file has a lot of power time spent in this intensity, which is above threshold. And over here, it looks like there's a heart rate that was that spent a lot of time up in the max region of heart rate. Well, this was a race. And so now for a race, I'm spending more time in an intensity that's higher in both my heart rate and my power data are telling me the same story. 
And there's other pieces of information in here, but I just wanted to share with you, here's just one way to analyze the data is to look at the power distribution uh, that you have during the during an, a ride uh, to try to understand uh, the types of intensity that you're using during training and then the types of intensity that you would use during a race. And obviously with that race, we want to keep trying to train to have a higher intensity or longer time uh, at higher intensities that we can sustain. All right, there's lots of other ways you, you can analyze power data. This is just a scatter plot of force on the pedal versus how fast the pedal's moving. Remember, that's power, okay? But this is just a lot of different data points where um, I can generate a lot of force over a short period of time. But when I'm trying to go for a longer period of time, Time's going longer over here as this uh, x-axis is going to the right. I'm generating less force. And that's typical, right? We can generate a lot of power in a short period of time using both the anaerobic and the aerobic systems. But when we're using the aerobic system primarily, when we're trying to go for a longer um, duration uh, ride, the amount of power that we can generate actually goes down. It's not as fast in converting chemical energy to mechanical energy. All right, so what do you do with all these data? Well, I'm talking about a few things here already. Let's dive into a little bit more. Well, here's, here's a nice plot of metabolic cost, watts, but that's metabolic cost. So think, so think of that in terms of VO2 and mechanical power, also watts, all right? There's an agreement between using watts because this is now power, metabolic power, and this is mechanical power. And look at this nice relationship. I don't have to tell you too much about the experiment other than this is riding at a submaximal effort. This is not maximal. This is submaximal effort. And when you ride at steady state, submaximal, there is a really nice relationship between mechanical power and metabolic power. Okay, I've told you how to measure mechanical power. Well, how do you measure metabolic power? Well, you need to go into the lab and use a machine that costs probably forty, fifty thousand dollars. $50,000. That's your metabolic heart. That's where you put the mask on and you breathe air in and out and, you, and that air that's exhaled is sent to a computer and it's analyzed for its oxygen content and carbon dioxide content. And in that analysis will tell how much the person is using oxygen and how much carbon dioxide is being exhaled which is a byproduct of both um, aerobic and anaerobic pathways, VCO2 is. Um, <clears throat> so I can carry that $40,000, $50,000 piece of equipment around with me, or I can do something very easy. I can measure mechanical power and use that as a proxy, as a substitute for VO2. And when we have a nice relationship like this, this actually tells us, this correlation between mechanical power and metabolic power is really good. Mechanical power is a really good predictor of VO2. So it ends up being an easy tool that doesn't cost 40, 40 to $50,000 and it, I can put it on the bike and I can view the data in real, almost real time. It becomes a really popular tool to use not only for training, uh, designing training programs, but also creating a race plan, when to use a plan to use a lot of power or when to back off on uh, power based upon uh, the course logistics. So now I wanna just go over a couple of terms that uh, people use to describe the power data that they're, they're getting from their uh, devices. Well, one is average power and it's simple. It's just, it is literally just the average power over some time period. You may look at 30 seconds, you may look at an hour, you may look at two hours, whatever it is. You're taking just the average power of that time window. Simple, easy to calculate, easy to understand. However, it does not work well when your intensity is changing a lot. And the reason is, is that every data point just gets treated to be equal weight. But we know that um, higher intensity efforts actually are 
exponentially hard, harder than, uh, than easy intensities. And so the average power is not a good um, parameter when we're doing something like in interval training or where we're not having a consistent effort ride, where we're going uphills or downhills or changing the pace, what have you. A better term in that case is normalized power. Well, what's normalized power? Well, normalized power is mathematically, I got it down here. What we do is we take each data point and we raise it to the fourth power. Why fourth power? Well, ends up it ends up that the fourth power actually ends up being a really good estimate of uh, physiology when you do this. And there's been a lot of neat work on using the squaring the data points or taking a cube or what have you. Um, in this case, it's uh, the fourth power. So you raise every data point to the fourth power, you add up all those data points, and then you divide by that number of data points. And then you take, uh, you, then you, um, you don't take the square root, you now reduce it by one quarter um, to uh, get normalized power. What this does is a really neat way to emphasize harder and the, the, the impact of higher intensities. So take, for example, there's the cat that knocked the dish over. Not a good cat. Um, take, for example, the number two. If you square that, let's just stay with square because I can do that in my head. Two squared is four. Well, what, do you, what number do you get if you square 0.5? And if you think about it, you're throwing in your calculator or whatever. If you square 0.5, you get 0.25 you get a smaller number. So by raising doing raising a, a number by some power, in this case, we're doing the fourth power, you're actually emphasizing bigger numbers more. You're weighting them more. And the smaller numbers or the numbers close to zero have very little impact on the overall average value of this uh, normalized uh, routine. So normal, normalized power is just using the fourth power and then uh, taking a quarter uh, power at the end. So it's like um, squaring and then taking a square root, uh, but we just do uh, fourth power. And that, what the purpose that is, is it emphasizes the, um, the importance of higher intensities when you start to describe uh, an overall intensity for the entire ride. And so many physiological responses are more related to this fourth power, this normalized power type of routine. Another term that uh, cyclists use uh, quite a bit to talk with each other is functional threshold power. And that is uh, just a, a term that got coined oh, probably about 20 years ago. And it ends up uh, being it ended up being defined as the power that someone can sustain for one hour. Why one hour? Well, 40K time trial is a very popular cycling event. And really, it was probably built around that concept that if you can go in under an hour for 40K, you're, you're a, a really good uh, time trialist. And so that's sort of where I, I understand that the uh, functional threshold power being the power uh, for one hour uh, where that came from. Now, critical power is another term that's used, not as much in the cycling world, but in the research world. And critical power is the power that you can sustain indefinitely. So that's going to be much lower power. So the power that you can sustain for one hour is going to be whatever, 200 watts. This power that you can sustain, sustain for indefinitely would be something that would have to be a lower intensity. So trying to understand what these... Uh, these um, these points are are actually helpful in designing a training program. And so here's just an example. Here's you know a training program that's where the intensity is based upon percentages of your functional threshold power, of that power that you can sustain for an hour. Now, how do you figure that out? Well, that's a whole nother issue. Uh, there's a wide variety of tests to try to understand and predict what your functional threshold power is. This is nothing more than, than something that would be similar to heart rate zone. But instead of looking at your heart rate watch, you're now looking at your power computer while you're riding and you're trying to understand what uh, wattage to use to be at different percentages of FTPs. 
FTP. And then that is telling you which energy system that ultimately you, you are stressing. So this, again, just, just an example. And this has probably been modified uh, several times uh, since this came out. This is Coggins Power Training Levels that came out some 15 years ago. Okay, now interpreting the data. Uh, this is where uh, power meter becomes really valuable is you can start doing all sorts of analyses to understand how your training is going, ultimately to try to make sure that you're having an effective training program to get to race day. I'm just gonna go through um, really just, I think I've got one here. Yep, I just got this one here. And this is the power duration curve. This is a very popular way that, that uh, people have started to look at power up people, uh, athletes. Uh, researchers have been using this for some time but athletes are starting to use this a little bit more to evaluate their training program and evaluate their fitness over time. So here's power on the y-axis and here's time on the x-axis. I've got short time over here, 15 seconds, one minute, five minutes, seven hours here. So this is not um, equal intervals here. <coughs> this is on uh, more of a logarith logarithmic type of scale. So this is seven hours here, 15 seconds, one minute, five minutes, what have you. This is power on the y-axis. So if I look at where the, this point crosses the x-axis, this is saying I generated 500 watts over 15 seconds at some point in a ride. Here it says I generated about 200 watts for five minutes. And over here, I generated about 180 watts for two hours. All right. So these are uh, this is not a, a, a continuous plot here. This is not time in terms of of uh, ride. This is uh, accumulated data points that I biked for that wattage for that period of time. And this is probably oh, well over a thousand rides that I have. So this line here oh, and this is very typical. So I can generate a lot of power for a short period of time. This is uh, 900 watts for oh, uh, just two or three seconds, okay? Uh, that's ATP CP. Over here, I can generate 130 watts, well, four hours. I can go, I can go a long time on four, this, this plot just ends here, but I can do 130 watts for a long period of time. All right, I can, I, I'm surprised I don't have a data point here at seven hours or what have you. But I do have one for this other line here. This, this is uh, 2018. This thin line is 2024. The thick line is 2018. A little bit of a difference there, right? Well, 2024, I'm 60 years old. 2018, I'm 54 years old. I wish I had uh, more power data when I was younger, but power meters were not that readily available. Uh, they've really only become more available um, really in the last decade. Uh, and I, I did not necessarily have a lot of data uh, even pre-2016. I don't have all the data up in Strava. And that's one of the problems why I don't have, uh, I would have liked to put 2016 down, but I don't have that. But here's a neat little observation. As I've gotten older, the amount of power that I can sustain for any time period has gotten lower. It's part of aging. <laughs> Don't get old, right? Uh, but anyways, uh, here, you know, back in 2018, I could generate over a thousand watts for that same two to three second period of time. Whereas now, 2024, I'm about 900 watts. So a bit of decrement. Maybe it's training, maybe it's age, whatever it is, but, uh, but we do see a change over time. And so I can start even looking at this curve, even trying to predict my FTP, my functional threshold power. And there's different math uh, algorithms that we've used to try to use this type of, of curve to give that a good sense of what that is. And then you can monitor how that uh, changes over time. Probably back in 2018, my functional threshold power was 290, 300 watts. 2024, 20, uh, my functional threshold power is probably 200 watts, maybe 220. So much of a lower uh, part of age, part of training, what have you. But we can start using power to understand cycling a little bit more.
Okay, just wrapping this up, um, power, you need to know what that is, rate of work being done, units watts, force times velocity, or torque times angular velocity. Uh, the parameters uh, that I went over, average power, normalized power, uh, functional threshold power, those are three big terms to, uh, to know. And then how we use power, setting up training programs. I didn't talk so much about using power during a race, but uh, then it, you can actually create a real nice plan based upon uh, your knowledge of your functional threshold power uh, to design a, a, a race plan for you, especially in triathlon that allows you to be successful uh, in the run. Okay, that's a little bit deeper dive on power. Thanks everybody.